Guten, guten Morgen, Bonjour, Bon Dia. Uh, no sé. Bueno, vamos a dar paso a una. We should start a session whose goal is to share city projects, interesting city projects. My intention, or if you like, is that we do a presentation of the lectures, and I would ask if the previous slide could be shown again to see who the speakers are. And what I suggest, I am taking my time because what I imagine would happen is happening, that people are having their a cup of coffee and they're coming in little by little. Well, that's fantastic. They're all in. OK, now we start. It's uh, the real start now. So this session, I think it's interesting. It'd be good if we could close at 10 to 12, because according to the organizers, the plenary starts at 12, so we should be finishing before that. And basically, what I have, well, my name is Vicente Domingo, and I am the director of the World Center of Valencia for Urban Sustainable Food, SEMAS an agreement between FAO, Fund of Agriculture Organization, and Valencia. And what I wanted to say is that basically what we have observed in the cities is that they have a need. I would say feminine need to share what they do. The countries keep the information to themselves. They create borders and they have their own policies linked to creating identities in some places where you can, can't even create an identity. But cities are very human. Uh, they are pragmatic. To me and to some sociologists, they are feminine because they meet, they join together. In 2017, Valencia was a town who organized the cities of the Pact of Milan. And quickly, there was a climate, a concept was created that we called Love is in the Air, because it was beautiful. It was really nice to see the city of Copenhagen that uh, bumped into a friend from Joburg and said, I have a problem with my suburban districts. I have a problem of uh, Supply and then Amsterdam said, "Well, we do it this way." And Barcelona said, "Well, we 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 do this and and the other." So there was a dialogue because cities are the cradle of civilization. We, if we are citizens, it's because some twelve thousand years ago, more or less, a miracle took place. A human miracle took place. We were capable. We were able to manage our food, our nutrition. Before that, we had been uh, walking around in tribes for 200,000 years. We were hunters, collectors, but all of a sudden in uh, Syria, in the area where uh, Syria now between Tigris and Euphrates, we started growing our own food and growing our food. Cities were created and being cities created, empires and roots and cultures were created and an exchange. And writing happened to give a date how much uh, recording how much excess food I had. Before that, there was no excess food. The planet was an equation, and the result was zero. But now it turns out that we can grow more grain, and I can have more children. I can create a social structure. In 12,000 years, which is nothing in the history of societies, look at where we are now. Thank you.
to the extent that you, I don't believe so because you're experts and you work with your own uh, mayors, but if you want to start working uh, on this, please uh, realize that this is the essence of humanity. Food is the essence of the humankind. We are people, we are citizens because we create our own food. And then some guys came and they made uh, food a big business and they um, destroyed people's dignity. But the projects we're going to hear today, basically, they are, they have two goals for sure, to dignify people's lives for being citizens of a place and to fight against terrible imbalances such as climate change or the shame that is implied by the fact that every day people die of hunger and at the same time people die out of obesity. That's madness. But there you go. This is through errors that we learn. After this context presentation, we are going to meet. It is an honor and a pleasure to open the floor to the first presentation that comes from Birmingham. Something that I wish uh, that happened is that I would ask the uh, presentation not to be too long because I will need, we have two microphones, not one, we have two, so that people can talk in the room. So I would ask you not to touch the microphone. What's your name? Anna? Anna? who is a fantastic young lady because I saw how she worked yesterday and she's doing it so well. So she will hold the microphone, but you must not touch it, things of the COVID. But I'd be delighted if after the presentations we'd create a dialogue. Something comes to my mind that I won't do, but hold your chair and make a circle. But, well, it is not, well, unless the situation is so exciting and let's make a circle and let's talk about what we're interested in. But to me, it is a pleasure, really, to give floor to Justin Varney from Birmingham. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I, this is the first time I have done Pecha Kucha, so I will try 20 seconds per image. Uh, there are only 20 images, so we will see how we go. Uh, so I will start my timer now, and I am uh, Director of Public Health for the City of Birmingham. So uh, Birmingham has a long history, uh, and this is what Birmingham used to look like. Um, Birmingham is England's second city and has been at the centre of the Industrial Revolution uh, and was once known and is still to some extent known as a city of a thousand trades. And even from our creation as a city, we have been a global city where people have come to trade, to make things. We're still the epicentre of the jewellery industry in the UK. This is Birmingham now. Uh, a very different view of the city. Um, <clears throat> had I moved the image a little bit across, you would still be able to see one of the churches from that historical picture. But we are now very much a melting pot of the world, and that is reflected in our relationship with food. Next year, we host the Commonwealth Games, and we will see uh, athletes and officials and visitors from all over the world come to our city uh, to celebrate through 17 days of sport and a six-month cultural program, the enjoyment of being a city that is part of the world and has the world in it. And food is a really important part of the conversation that we are having in the run-up to the Commonwealth Games, not just for the food and the water that we serve at the Games themselves, celebrating the diversity of our city and our culture, but also how we can use the Games as a space to reinforce our conversations with other Commonwealth cities about what they're doing in food systems. 
Food is also an important part of the identity of cities. Uh, and although this is an Italian painting from Rossetti, uh, it currently lives in the Museum of Art in Birmingham and is just one of many paintings which reflect the celebration of food in the history of our city. And food today is now a big part of our economy. We have a culture in which we have the first Indian Michelin star restaurant in the UK was in Birmingham. We have award-winning chefs and an award-winning food school. Uh, and we are part of the Delice network of cities which celebrates the culture and the value of food to cities in terms of their cultural identity, tourism and trade. And it's important to acknowledge this when we talk about food systems because we have to think about the potential negative impacts of what we're trying to do to improve a food system on some aspects of the food system, like high-end uh, food retail. There is also low-end food retail. And like many other cities, we face the challenge of global multinationals uh, buying up property, bringing what are in reality very, very good jobs with good training and learning and development for staff in deprived parts of our city. But they bring with them unhealthy products and an unhealthy food environment. And for a municipality, the challenge between do I take the jobs in an area which desperately needs employment from a good employer, but that employer produces bad things, and how do we navigate that discussion and that decision? We also have food industry in the city. Although we are a very urban city, uh, we are home to uh, Mondelez Cadbury. Uh, the Bourneville, which is a part of the city, was founded on the creation of chocolate. So chocolate is at the heart of the identity of food in our city as well. And a really good example of how do we navigate as a city a really valued employer with a product that is unhealthy and fundamentally has a huge carbon footprint because we are unable to produce cacao in England in the English climate. Through all of our approach to food, communication has been key and is at the heart of how we change our food system, working with our citizens to hear their voices and to understand how, what food means to them. I was discussing with colleagues from Bordeaux last night, how do you have this conversation? And we started with the conversation with the simple question, what does food mean to you? Food is something we celebrate with. It's something we mourn with. It's something we show love and affection with. It is an integral part of our identity and our society and our cultural exchange. And we have to consider that as part of our approach to food systems work. There you go. But we also have to recognise that we now work and live in an environment in which everyone is connected. And as a global city, one of our biggest challenges is how do we navigate information from across the world? We, to some extent, can control the posters, the signs, the food education in the context of Birmingham, but we cannot do it in the context of Pune in India or in Wuhan in China. And yet our citizens are in daily contact with families and friends through WhatsApp and Facebook and other platforms. And their beliefs and their practices about food are so linked to their country of heritage that if we do not acknowledge and think about that and talk about that as global cities together, then we struggle to change behaviours for a healthier and a more sustainable food economy. And alongside that, that sense of family being something more than the people you live in a house with, that in many of our cultures, family extends across the world and they are in daily contact with families in other countries where the beliefs and the behaviours come from. But we also face a change in what is considered normal. Gender stereotypes are changing. The approach to cooking is changing. Over the last 30 years in the UK, the amount of cooking TV shows has exponentially increased. We are one of the largest consumers of cookery books in Europe. We are a, city, a, a country which is obsessed with baking, as any of you who have seen The Great British Bake Off will know. Yet that is not translating into people cooking at home. We like to watch people cook. 
but it is not translating into us actually cooking ourselves. And that is a real challenge for us as a city and one I think we all face across the world. Because we are all connected, and whether we like it or not, the COVID pandemic has truly brought home how connected we are as cities and how connected we are as citizens. What happens on the other side of the world has a ripple effect in Birmingham. And so this network and the partnership of the pact is fundamental to our approach and how we tackle our food system for the betterment of our citizens. The content of this shopping basket comes from all over the world. Much as we might like to, it is virtually impossible to grow bananas in Birmingham. We can probably get away with courgettes. And we need to talk about that because as a city for us to influence the global trade system is hard. Yesterday, we launched the City Pledge on Food Justice, talking with the UN Special Rapporteur on Food Justice. And he is absolutely clear, cities' voices need to be in this space. We need to work together, not just in our member states, not just across Europe, but across the world, because so much of the food system is done at a global level. And as a city, for us to influence that, we can play at the edges. We can throw little pebbles into the water. But if we truly want to change the shoreline, we all need to be working together to create ripples that create waves that move the shore of the food system to a better place for our citizens. Because ultimately our citizens, this is where they shop. It is delightful and lovely in Barcelona to see so many vegetable shops and greengrocers in, in local communities. It is something we have lost in Birmingham, we have lost in the UK. The march of the supermarkets has taken that from us. And it is very difficult to build it back in without massive subsidy, which in today's economic climate is not sustainable. So we have citizens who have their choice defined by the supermarket, not by themselves. And that is an important aspect of understanding how do we create a healthy and sustainable food system, which is culturally appropriate and diverse, and how do we influence those global chains of supermarkets? Because it is a global trade issue. And much of this, there are very bad things in the way that food is produced globally, and many of the things we've been talking about over the last couple of days have demonstrated the climate change impact of the food chain and the food system is something we must take more seriously and must act on today. It is also something that requires partnership and collaboration for us to raise our voices together to be able to address. Because this is the result if we do not work together. Many of you know, unfortunately, my country chose to leave the European Union um, and that has created additional barriers and challenges for us. But this was not created primarily by supply chain issues. This was created because the media escalated and exacerbated people's fears. And all of us through the pandemic have experienced that. In England, we were obsessed with toilet roll and baked beans. I understand in Italy, it was a slightly different thing. <laughs> in France, there was a different focus as well. But that panic buying tipped over a system which was designed in just-in-time supply chains. And that is a common issue and a common challenge for all of us. How do we create more resilient systems so that when the media do create a storm and create anxiety and concern, we don't end up with empty shelves where those that cannot get to the supermarket fast enough do not have food on their plates? And this is the core of the point that I wanted to make today. As we work on food systems in our own cities, we must work together because this should not be an argument about the planet over profit. It should not be an argument about health over wealth. We have to find a different narrative to talk about the economics of the food system in the context of a globally diverse culture and globally diverse system in which we work. Because as the pandemic has shown us, we are all in this together. And what happens on one part of the world very quickly becomes an issue for another part of the world. And I do not want us to see the lessons from the pandemic lost 
because we have gained so much while we have lost so many. And the final lesson that I leave you with is that as the pandemic has taught us, we must talk to each other, we must connect to each other, we must build the bridges and make them stronger through the partnership of the pact. Thank you very much. Thank you, Justin. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, oh, I see more people here. Be very welcome here. Uh, now, it's, but don't forget, uh, it's, no, hablo en castellano, verdad? Mejor, perdón. La intención. So, the goal is that uh, after listening to the proposals, so we can open a Q&A session so that we can all talk and we can start the uh, social feeling, so to say, that Greek, uh, co that Greek people called Agora and Roman people called Forum, and uh, uh, Northern African countries called it Zoko, Zok. So it's a meeting point. The concept of exchanging, this makes us uh, amazing. So now we're going to listen to if the uh, manche uh, from Bordeaux. So, yes, hello. So, my name is Eve Demange. I live in Bordeaux, a city of uh, almost, do um, you hear me well? Yes. Uh, 300,000 souls in the south of France. I'm sure you know Bordeaux. The city uh, gave its name to the wine. I'm a member of the French Ecological Party and uh, in the 2020, we won the municipal elections. Uh, Bordeaux is also known as the city of stones, registered on the UNESCO uh, World Heritage List because of the beauty of its classical architecture. Uh, from the right bank of the river, you have an amazing view on the beautiful stone facade and a water mirror that make our inhabitants very proud. But last week, this made the front page of our local news newspaper, Sudwest. Here is how Bordeaux will look like if our generation fail to fix the problem of climate change. The stone city will become the water city. My three kids ask me if the mayor of Bordeaux could do something about this. Well, Bordeaux certainly has to change many things to make our future better. The IPCC report say that humans are responsible for global warming, warming without doubt. The only way out is to reduce drastically our carbon emission. But what does it mean exactly? In France, we need to reduce our carbon footprint from 12 tons of CO2 per person per year to two tons. 25% of our emissions depend on the way we eat. So here we go. I am in charge of food resilience for the city of Bordeaux. This is a new delegation we created. So what could be done? During the first year, uh, we met all the associations and inhabitants who were interested by local food. And we completed diagnos diagnosis to understand uh, the situation, yeah, a big diagnostic. And the first problem is Bordeaux has only seven days of uh, food self-sufficiency, which is nothing. But there is a good news. The whole region of New Aquitaine uh, produces six times more than what, what uh, its inhabitants need. So there is lots of possibilities for us to eat more local. The second problem, 
our agriculture is a, is a monoculture one, wine growing oriented and dependent of oil. We export 96% of what we produce locally and we import 92% of what we eat. We have no more local canneries and food processing companies. The third problem, we will soon lack of farmers. More than half of our farmers are going to retire in the next 10 years. And young generation doesn't want to produce food anymore. They think farming is a hard job which doesn't pay enough. So, <laughs> to be more resilient and lower our carbon emission, we need to change a lot of things. And to make this big change happen in Bordeaux, we need to involve a large community to create a resilient, united, well-nourished and healthy city. French love for food is a good start. Yeah, this is the chef, Michel Guérard, you know, uh, in the City Hall Vegetable Garden. When we arrived, we started this, uh, this garden. So how can we start? First of all, we want to support agricultural production to improve the city's food uh, self-sufficiency. We want to create a kind of good food network urban farms all around the city dedicated to local food production and a pride to eat local. We saved one hectare of family garden uh, that were planned to be destroyed and 40 hectares site which was to be urbanized in order to develop a very ambitious agroecological project. We decided to settle a farmer on four hectares of land we had near our city tree nursery. We want our inhabitants to know and support their farmers. We are creating two farms on both uh, sides of the river, right in the pop uh, middle of popular neighborhoods. Those two areas currently lack of uh, local, local grocery stores. We want to give people a place to do gardening, buy local food, cook, eat, make plants, and have projects together. We want to reconnect local produ producers with local consumers by developing short food channels. We uh, recently selected uh, 22 um, projects following a call for projects, including solidarity grocery stores. We want to make local food easy, accessible everywhere for all our inhabitants. By the end of the year, we will launch the Food Citizen Council. We want to gather our inhabitants in the eight neighborhood of Bordeaux and build community project to allow everybody to access to quality food. We will write together a community, community plan for our future, the City Good Food Program. Local food for all our inhabitants is at the core of, of, of our city project. 29% uh, of French people have fin fi financial difficulties to consume fresh fruits and vegetables every day. We want to work on the idea of food democracy by testing a local version of a social food security. And this year, we tested new vegetarian recipes in, in our central kitchen for city school. We listen to the kids' opinion to improve our meals. In our school, we will significantly increase the share of quality label products. In our nurseries, we aim at 100% uh, uh, organic and local meals by uh, 226, 2026. Sorry. Uh, Bordeaux has its own wholesale food market in the middle of the city, the mean. Our restaurants and grocery stores come there to buy their products. We want the mean to become a place of sale and promotion of sustainable food and local gastronomy. We need to change our food system and to make that happen. We, need to, we are working with the 28 municipalities of our metropolis, thanks to one of the most innovative governance models in Europe. 
This current governance model is recognized by the European Food Trails project. And at last, our Academy of Gardeners will allow our inhabitants to learn how to produce their own food because behind our classical stone facade of the 18th century, we have an incredible number of private gardens. By 2026, we aim to produ produce at least 10% of our needs in fruits and vegetables, and most important, put Bordeaux on the path of a new food system. Thank you. Thank you, Eve. Merci bien. Bueno, ahora vamos. Now we are going to give the floor to Emmanuel. And uh, he belongs to an infrastructure of a city that uh, was a green capital, Vitoria. And a few years ago, they were pioneers. So they were just uh, looking at Vitoria, what Vitoria was doing. So they have created a path, a very interesting path with very good ideas that we could model and copy. So women all, whenever you want. Uh, good morning, everybody. I see there are far more people without headsets than with headsets, so I will do it in English. Uh, thank you, Vicente, for, for the warm introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and it's a pleasure to have been invited, even if it was last minute, to this Pechacucha presentation. So the slides that I'm going to show were prepared very freshly this morning, so apologies if there are any uh, mistakes or not proper layout, right? Um, good. Um, the title of the presentation, Seed Now Harvest in 50 Years, um, well, I, I guess that all of us will agree that creating transformational change in the food system sector needs action now, but the products or the results, that really, if, if they are transformational and structural results, they would come probably in the next decades. They are not immediate changes. Um, very quickly, a short introduction of what it, the Center for Environmental Studies that I am currently directing uh, means for the city. We are some sort of satellite department that connects the implementation and the policies that the city creates with research that other partners, universities, et cetera, do. So our city has this department embedded in, in its structure to connect these two worlds, right? So we are kind of the environmental think tank of the city. Vitoria Gasteiz, for those who are not familiar where we are located, we are in the Basque country here in northern Spain. Uh, let me see if this has a laser, no? Okay, well, you see in the little map there, the bottom city, Vitoria Gasteiz, right? This is how the municipality looks like from an aerial view. I just want to point out some of the information in this slide. There is a lot of information. Mainly look at the map in the middle. You'll see that uh, the total area of the municipality is 277 square kilometers. We have around 20 to 25% of that surface has been already urbanized, and the remaining one is divided in two halves, agriculture and forests. Um, we have around 12,000 hectares of productive land, and 8% of the surface is currently considered Natura 2000 uh, protected areas. Just pointing out some uh, data. We are, our population is also important, 255,000 inhabitants. Um, Vicente already mentioned the city was awarded with the Green Capital of Europe Award in 2012, and one of the main projects that was very much valued was the urban planning uh, strategy that was leading to the creation of this green ring, that it's an interconnected set of peri-urban parks. Some of them are restored uh, ecosystems or even restored wetlands, and the city has built kind of this ring connecting all those parks, and now we have a beautiful area for this, I mean, from the center of the city, it's just two kilometers to this green, and um, it's, it's excellent, especially in these COVID times, all our citizens had somewhere to escape when we were allowed to leave our house. Good, um, now jumping in the food system strategy, we've done, we've done already some meters in this path. Uh, 
everything started with a bottom-up uh, initiative from the inhabitants that was at one point taken over by the public uh, administration. And that was in 2014 when the city wrote a declaration, we want a more sustainable food system. In 2015, there was the very first baseline uh, conducted. And that was assessed and discussed in a very intense participatory process in 2016. 2017, uh, we became a member of the Milan Pact. And also on that same year, the Municipal Action Plan and Strategy were published. Uh, here we see those documents. Last week, we also signed the Glasgow Food and Climate Declaration. So this is a little bit the policy or the involvement of the city when it comes to policy. What is our approach? Well. From the very beginning, we are doing this together with the local stakeholders. Um, now we have this official strategy and action plan, and something that we are not there yet, but it's something that we would like to achieve, is being multi-level. What do I mean by this? The action plan and the strategy that we currently have only considers municipal competencies. And we realize that if we want to push our city farther when it comes to uh, food systems, especially the production part, we need to partner with our provincial government. And then <clears throat> we like to use this framework that divides the food systems into these four main activities, right? We have production, processing, distribution, and consumption. And in the current slides, what I'll show are projects that either tackle all of them holistically or try to uh, act on one of these elements and slowly build up some sort of momentum through small projects to change and to leverage it to, a, to this transformational change, right? So uh, this is gonna be like me showing all my uh, clocks, watches, and the goal is if any of you is doing something similar, a project that resonates with something that you are also struggling with or having challenges, I'll be very happy if, you, if we can discuss later on, right? So I'm just showing what we are doing. Not everything is working perfectly. We have challenges in, in many of these projects, apologies. Um, but, um, Happy to discuss later on. So the very first one is we are uh, working towards a land bank. This is one of the challenges that we see for local producers, uh, sorry, local new entrepreneurs that would like to start a farm. There's not available land. So what we've done is we've done a catalog of the land that the city owns that could be available. And we are now thinking maybe to start talking to the church because probably the church has some land. So uh, we didn't start this uh, uh, strategically, but we think that they could be a very interesting partner. Um, <clears throat> this is something that we are taking very seriously. We are doing um, kind of going through, I mean, on top of the city, I didn't say that when we saw the map, we have 63 tiny villages within the same municipality. And these, municipal, these little villages have a, still a very rural personality, and they keep a lot of this rural tradition. So we are doing interviews with elderly people from all these villages to collect local varieties that were used until 60 years ago when all these commercial varieties started kicking out our traditional varieties. And we are collecting this genetic material and storing it, and also whenever possible, whenever we find people who are still alive. We try to get also that wisdom of how did you use to cultivate this? What recipes did you use to cook with this, et cetera, et cetera, right? So before, this is quite urgent because uh, the average age of, this, of the, who, of the people who, who we are interviewing is 85 years old. So uh, the, we are now, we did the first phase. We conducted, we uh, covered the western uh, little villages of the municipality. And now in the second phase, we are going to cover the eastern uh, little villages. <clears throat> the city of Vitoria Gasteiz owns its own germoplasma bank, and this is where we are keeping all this genetic material, storing it, freezing it, and renewing it uh, every now and then. Um, of course, we are also working on community gardens. Currently, we have 356 parcels or plots active. There is a huge demand on behalf of the city. We had a call last week. There were 50 empty parcels. You can only use them for a maximum of two to three years. So every now and then there are free parcels. And we made a call, and there were 500 interested people for 50 parcels. So this also shows that this, this uh, tendency came to stay. And we are now also planning to build two new of these community gardens. And in addition, we are also working with schools to have 
uh, gardens built up within the schools. This is things that we've already done. Now, one interesting project that we are aiming at uh, in the future would be to create a new livestock farm. Um, we have some prairie ecosystems in the municipality which are at the moment unused, and they were created because of livestock farming. We lost a lot of the livestock farms in the municipality, and we are now creating this collaboration between a farm company, a, a, a shepherd's a company, and us to push such an initiative. And that would create probably a lot of synergies. We are aiming at having this uh, sheep maybe cut the grass of the, some of these peri-urban parks. We want to recover those prairie ecosystems. We have a lot of these forest lands that I showed in the map. Um, they've been not properly managed, so there is a lot of dry bush uh, accumulated at the bottom. So we believe that having this livestock uh, traditional forest management systems could also reduce the fire risk. Of course, education, bringing schools later on to this farm and supply the city with dairy and meat products. This would be a dream. We are working on it. There's, it's still a, an, a, an idea. Discussions are going very positive, are being very positive. <clears throat> so I hope that maybe next year in Rio or in two years, I'll come and I'll be able to say this is already started. Um, we are having a student also assessing how the CAP influenced and impacted our agricultural landscape. And uh, at the moment, over 80% of what we are producing is cereals. We believe this is probably a consequence of the, uh, of the CAP system. We lost almost all our horticulture. So understanding this from the root might also help us see how we can steer it in the future. Um, I move now to processing. Food transformation, this is probably one of our weak points. The city used to have mills, used to have sugar making companies, used to have abattoirs, we lost all them. Uh, this is one of these companies that was active until 20 years ago, it was a mill and a bakery, and it was abandoned, and now we are thinking, okay, what can we do with this, right? Uh, we want to refurbish it and maybe create some sort of small scale rent basis mill, for uh, local cereal producers. As it also wants, we also wanted to have a social uh, spirit. So there are discussions going on on what to do with this. It's not yet clear. If anybody here has good ideas, I'm very happy to talk to you later. Uh, or examples of other cases. I know Moa too has, we already discussed uh, of, about some ideas, but very happy to exchange with any of you. Any of you. When it comes to distribution, we have a, mar a farmer's market in place. This is working very fine. And uh, we are now conducting a baseline assessment, interviewing the big supermarkets, the wall wholesale market. We have a very small wall wholesale market, but it's still there, and shops, neighborhood shops. And we want to understand what moves them or limits them uh, when it comes to selling local production and local could be not, not per se from the municipality, could also be past country, neighboring Spanish regions, but we see that the share of these products is still very small, and we want to understand it why. Is it because there's no produce? Is it because they don't stick to the requirements that some of these uh, players uh, demand? And how can we build maybe some pilot projects together with them, right? So this is something that we are starting next year. We are currently conducting a city food flows, uh, empirically obtaining amounts of how much food uh, the wholesale market sells and how much food the supermarket sell. And uh, next year we will ask the shops, the neighborhood shops. And the idea is to get a, a picture of A, in Gasteiz, per person you consume, we are known a little bit that the, like, like the potato city because we used to produce a lot of potatoes before the cereals came in. Uh, so imagine if the message is, out of the 100 kilograms of potato that a family consumes per year, only two kilograms are local. That would be kind of a shock uh, picture, and we want to get that shock picture. So uh, hopefully it will be a little bit more than two kilograms, but we suspect it's not gonna exceed 10 kilograms. So, um, so this is something that we would like to use also to activate a little bit citizens and to increase awareness. And that's it. So if we put all these things in place, hopefully in 50 years we'll start hopefully earlier, but the transformational change will still take some time. But um, yeah, we are moving forward. So uh, yeah, thank you for your attention.
Thank you very much, Imanol. Muchas gracias. Es que ricasco. Uh, now it's time of Tivo. It's well said, Tivo. Okay. From the, the wonderful city of Moansartou. It's ex very exemplar. Uh, uh, five years ago, a good friend in FAO, uh, Florence Hall, well, uh, start to tell me about the wonderful things they are doing in that city. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the nice introduction. So um, my name is Thibault Lalanne. I'm coordinator of the Center for Sustainable Food Education. It's the municipal service in charge of steering the food project in mont -Sartou. And I, I would like to start with uh, an apology because I've uh, actually, uh, I'm, not I'm not going to respect the requirements of Pecha Kucha. Um, so I'm really sorry for that, but actually the requirements were not clearly indicated for the presentation, so I decided to play with the rules, which is actually so sort of a transition for my presentation, because I would like to speak about public procurements and the constraint that public procurements represent for us all, actually, and I would like to present the example of Mont Sartou and how to tackle this, uh, this challenge. So Mont Sartou is uh, it's a small city of 10,000 inhabitants located in the southeastern part of France, close to Nice, Cannes. Um, and it is mainly known for its school canteens, which are 100% organic and, uh, and mostly composed of local produce. Um, years now, almost 10 years, we're going to celebrate the 10th year anniversary next year that we've, uh, we've distributing 100% uh, organic meals. What is important is that this uh, project actually started with school canteens and uh, this uh, enabled us to um, leverage to develop a much more ecosystemic food project on the territory. And now we are basically trying to address those uh, nine uh, sustainable development goals, working in a diversity of, uh, of fields from food education to a diversity of uh, audiences, uh, such as children, of course, but also the elderly, people in uh, social needs. We're also working in the uh, relocalization of farmers, uh, because you have to understand that we are on a, on a very densely urbanized territory, French Riviera, uh, so it's a, it's a big challenge that we, 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 we are facing. Um, we're also working in uh, engaging local businesses in changing their approach to uh, sustainable food. We're also working with uh, university research centers. Uh, we tend to be, or we try to be a laboratory on uh, resilience and, and sustainability of food. And uh, actually, we also try to, uh, to share our knowledge with a diversity of, uh, of territories in France and Europe. So we work, for instance, in a Biocantines project, a European project in which we've been accompanying a series of cities in developing their own food project and, and trying to reach this uh, organic distribution of food in school canteens. And actually, this, uh, this project um, that has been built for the past decade, I would say, has shown its results because we've managed to uh, actually assess the impact on food habits of inhabitants. And we actually, we've measured that 87% uh, of families have changed their food habits towards purchasing more organic and local food. Um, and this is mainly uh, thanks to the school canteens because we see that um, children are the main factor of change. You know, when they come back home and they say to their parents, well, I would like to eat as good as well as what I, hear, what I have at school. Or you have to understand what is organic, etc. So this is a key factor of change, we, we believe, uh, to change uh, food habits. Another illustration of this food project is our municipal farm. So when switching to 100% organic in school canteens, uh, the municipality launched a series of tenders to address, to, to work with uh, local farmers. And actually we didn't manage to work with them because we didn't receive any applications. So almost as a joke at the time, electric representatives uh, decided to, well, they just said, well, if no one wants to supply school canteens, we will do it ourselves. And this is what they did. In 2010, they built this municipal farm, which now employs three people, three municipal farmers, uh, which produces 25, 25 tons per year, distributed directly in school canteens, so less than one kilometer from, from the canteens, and on a property of uh, six hectares. And actually, in terms of public procurement, it is quite an interesting tool that we've, uh, we've developed because we managed to create a sound dialogue between food production 
and a food con con confection, sorry, so as to which enabled us to uh, basically adapt the way canteens function. So uh, how to cook with uh, raw produce, for instance, and a diversity of vegetables. We work very, with uh, 50 different types of species or different types of vegetables throughout the years. Uh, so how to learn how to basically work with this raw produce, but also in um, envisaging the, or uh, quantifying the quantity needed for school canteens and uh, adapting the, the food production in, in the municipal farm. COVID crisis that has struck us all, uh, which actually has been a, a symptom of the lack of resilience of our food systems. And I, I think that, I mean, it was perfectly illustrated beforehand. Uh, we are all facing the same situation and we are all know, all know understanding that uh, the globalization of uh, food markets, the specialization of uh, food protection throughout territories uh, means that we need, I mean, this has to stop. We need to relocate our food production. And sorry for the, the picture, which is not very good, but I just wanted to put that it's uh, the example of our food producer market that we have in Mont-Sartou, which remained open uh, throughout the COVID crisis. And we are very proud of that because it was a rare example uh, in, in France or in the region of a market which remained open. And so in terms of food relo relo relocation, sorry, um, cities have a great tool in their hands, which is public procurement. Uh, in France, uh, we produce around 3.5 billion of meals from uh, public or from collective catering, schools, hospitals, uh, private catering. So it's a great leverage. In 2018, uh, the French Parliament passed a law called EGALIM that fixed an objective of 20% of organic food in school canteens by next year, actually, and enabling cities to work with uh, farmers in conversion or convert towards the conversion towards organic food. And this is actually a great lever to support this conversion to organic and to work with uh, small and local, local producers. However, public procurement is not, might, might not be the, the schemes that we have in particular in Europe, and just a, a parenthesis. I mean, this is mainly focused on the, a European framework that we have, but we are in a global forum, and I would be very interested in, in knowing how it works in, in other parts of the world. The, the, the framework that we have is not adapted for this, actually. And we've been working with François Collard du Tilleul, which is a, who is a lawyer specialized in food sovereignty and uh, food democracy, and he says that we still need to adapt to the, the obligation of local authorities to follow the rules of public procurement with regard to the geographical origin of food produce. It is very difficult to basically uh, decide to work with local producers. In addition, especially when for, for small farmers, the, the burden in terms, the administrative burden to work with cities is extremely important, uh, sorting them out, opting them out of uh, our tenders. And also, it is very difficult for those for small farmers to commit in terms of food production for a month or years in advance. And so, so that's why the, those tools are, are not adapted. And it's even more paradoxical when you think about it, because we have a great diversity of guidelines, guides at national European level, telling us how to play with the rules. So I come back to the beginning of my presentation. Bending the law or inserting specifications, technical criteria uh, awards, uh, so as to enable us to work with small local producers. For instance, um, having a certain number of days uh, between uh, harvesting and delivery or a specific mode of transportation. So we have the tools, but it's still complicated. And also, when you think about it, there is a great imbalance between public authorities and private caterers. A public authority needs to abide by stringent rules, so these public procurement schemes, and if should it decide to delegate its competence to a private caterer, in charge of school canteen meals, for instance, it could easily indicate uh, an indication of geographical uh, origin. So, for instance, this private caterer could easily work with uh, farmers in a radius of 30 kilometers around the city, and that would be perfectly legal. So there is a great imbalance in this regard as well. So instead, basically, of playing with the rules, bending the law, why shouldn't we basically change the law? And that's actually why we're calling for a food exception 
in public procurement. We're not calling for something very re revolutionary. We're just calling for some further flexibility. For instance, a, a threshold of uh, like up to 30% of each load could be dedicated to uh, direct contracts from cities to local small producers. That would give us uh, the ability to work with them way easily. And, and I just wanted to share this basic reflection on what is food, actually. Food is not a, a community like any other. You don't buy a pen like you buy a, a turnip, because a pen is a simple tool, but the turnips and foods actually are essential goods for every inhabitant of the planet. So maybe that also means that we need to adapt our modes of exchanges, economic exchanges, to buy food. And that's all, that's all for me. Thank you very much. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much, Thibault. Uh, en, en las conclusiones finales. Thank you so much, Thibault. In the final conclusions, if they ask me to do a summary, I'm not sure which are what are going to be the main ideas after the conversation. But one of the main things is that we don't see a lot of difference between one presentation, Pecha Kucha, and the presentation standard normal that we've always seen. And this is important. If they ever ask you to do a Pecha Kucha, it's exactly the same as those which are not Pecha Kucha. But I know that Pecha Kucha in uh, Japanese, it means a small talk. And therefore, maybe we should talk about, well, you know, there's a town in France, you know, it's really cool. Well, I don't know, maybe. But we now leave the floor to Asha from Marseille, Aisha from Marseille. There are many French citizens of the world who are opening the expression of women in local governance. And uh, this is one of the few, last few opportunities we still have not to all die in the abysm. So congratulations, uh, uh, Marseille, for your mayor. Hello, sorry, uh, it's not for me a Peshakusha, it's a Peshakusha, but without pictures. <laughs> Only one, this one. Well, thank you for your invitation, and thank you for this uh, organization of this seventh forum. I'm Aisha Sif, and uh, as deputy mayor of Marseille, in charge of sustainable food and uh, the preservation of agricultural land, I therefore welcome uh, the collaborative initiatives of cities around the food transition favorable to both climate and social justice. They will allow us to progress quickly and obtain greater support from the states. The municipal majority of Marseille has the will to ensure quality food to all the inhabitants of the city. The ge geographical location of the metropolis within a diversified agricultural territory is particularly well suited to the implementation of devices recommended by the Pact of Milano in the fight against the climate and in environmental crisis, namely short secrets, the development of autonomy and food security to build a new solidarity at the same time as ensure quality jobs in the relocation sector of the production and distribution of food and to promote the social bond. In order to organize these new short circuits, 
of proximity in supply, we have begun to relocate um, to re relocation of agriculture, which needs land to cultivate, to install, uh, install new farmers in the city. To achieve that, we put an end to the concreting of the cultivable lands. Currently, 20 hectares are in the process of being classified as agricultural land. And therefore, the artificialization of soils. It's for us a strong message that we want to convey to the, res um, the habitants, residents, and the professional. We support all uh, measures to ensure the effective cultivation of agricultural areas, which are currently being registered on Local Plan of Urbanism, PLUE. For the next session, it's still 20 hectares that will be classified in zone A, zone agriculture. Today, 230 hectares of land remain to be saved. At the pace of 20 hectares per year, we could bring new food lands to production and allow near the city the development of local and of quality Pajan agriculture, thus guaranteeing outlets to feed our children in collective catering. By organizing food for all, by consolidating the emerging network of local and organic producers, and the platform and places of direct sale, but also to extend this sector to the diffusion of good products, multiplication of the places of sale distributed on all the territory, and to treat the question of food waste by relying on the devices of the state. But we think that productive spaces in urban areas is a real issue. I'm here with you today uh, to take a part in our workshop, uh, but also to send a strong signal to the states to involve the city and their networks in the global food governance and environment, and that they promote at a local level the decentralized, organized, and participatory governance that cities are calling for. Uh, these are strong signals that we are sending from Barcelona and soon to Glasgow to all citizens of the world waiting for access to a healthier and more sustainable food. Thank you. Uh, now we have. Thank you so much, Aisha. Now we have some 20 minutes in which we can put forward. Well, we have to give it all work to Anna because she said at the beginning of the conference I want to be the best microphone. Uh, Ishwa, there is a secret competition, uh, a secret contest between them to see who is uh, the best microphone carrier. So I ask you to make some reflection, to ask something interesting to Birmingham, because there was a, a call for attention. We were the epicenter of the Industrial Revolution. There is a wonderful writing by Caroline Still. Who, an architect who said, uh, we started losing our relationship with nature with the Industrial Revolution. When that started and a few days ago, a wonderful researcher in Valencia, Yolai Raigon, 
she was screaming on the International Day of Rural Women on the 15th of October, we must ruralize the cities because this is a part of identity work which is necessary. And I'll be ready to dash around because any question you have to any of the speakers, any suggestion, any idea, what we have started in these last few years is a process, a necessary process for all citizens. It is not one city is uh, better because it's gone a few steps forward ahead of others and the others are a little bit behind. No, they're all on the way and this is a long collaborative process and it is trans it is fundamental. It is so any proposal will be well received because we CDs talk to one another. There's, an issue, there's a question over there. Anna, please start your route to the sky. Your part of the sky. You know you shouldn't hold the microphone. Please just talk into it. Anna, if I said your name correctly. You talked about um, how you mapped city food flows. I was really interested in that. What kind of tools did you use for for, the, for creating those maps and those flows across the city. Yes, uh, thank you for the question. So, so far, um, the very first tool, it's interviewing people. You need to get the data. So the, um, we, we split the project into two phases. The first phase targets big supermar uh, supermarket chains and uh, the wholesale market of the city. And the second phase will target the neighborhood shops. Um, it's a lot of um, conv uh, convincing these big companies that their data is going to be in safe hands and that there's no intention to publish anything with a name. At the end of the day, the, the city food flows will be an aggregated picture of the city, right? Without you being able to distinguish, oh, this is coming from supermarket A, this is coming from supermarket B. Supermarket A has a very low percentage of local food. Where, no, that was not the intention, but they are very afraid of this. So it has been very difficult to get their data from supermarkets. We got uh, the, the one with the biggest, the, high, the biggest share of the city, the supermarket that sells most. We've got this information. They, sh they were willing to share the data so we can now extrapolate for the city because we know the percentages of share. But most of them were very reluctant. And this, yeah, this is also a reflection to be done, right? Like if we want to work this food topic, how are we, as cities, how can we I mean, of course, there are one million things to do, and we can always have uh, projects, small projects, but if we want to compare our picture, our CO2 footprint, right, if we would turn these amounts ba based on the origin, transport distances, you could estimate how much CO2 you've created. If we would like to compare our picture now and in 20 years, do we actually know what our picture now is, right? When we are saying now oh, we want to decarbonize food systems, we lack that information. So that's why we started this City Food Flows project, even though we knew it was going to be hard and most of the doors will be closed, but also to put that, uh, to make that contrast and say, hey, as a city, we cannot, we don't have any legal tool that, uh, or I don't know how to, how this could be translated into some sort of data traceability law that cities should be able to know this, right? Aggregate it without, uh, of course, um, the private information from each company is private, but that the aggregated picture doesn't harm anybody. So the methodologies, interviewing, trying to convince, and then data analysis, right? Uh, summing, dividing, uh, minus, plus, very easy. And, and for the traditional shop uh, sector, that would be second phase, that would be face-to-face -face interviews yeah, as well. Sampling, right? Doing some random sampling of uh, shop typologies, and yeah. Uh, creo que Maria. I think Maria wants to talk. Thank you for your presentations and your projects. There's a question, a bit general, because I think it is uh, for all the uh, uh, lectures. What resources, what funds 
were materialized. Well, I'm from Barcelona, and what is limiting to us is what a technical team, what, what, with what money, what money can you invest on these uh, projects? What type of uh, covenant, agreement, uh, contract? There is a limit that I see because we want to carry out these projects, but then um, putting that into practice is not easy. For urban orchards, for instance, there's a lot of voluntary work, but there's uh, not always the volunteers from the city that can do uh, these things. You have to have direct economy. So what resources, economic resources, are these projects funded by? Who supports them? This question goes to any of the speakers who have spoken now, but to any in technician or expert related to any municipality which is present in the room, if they know. OK? So in Birmingham, the funding for the food team comes from the public health budget. So I think in the UK, one of the things that is slightly different is we're approaching food from a health perspective rather than from necessarily an agricultural perspective in terms of food systems work. Um, but part of this is also about looking to influence other uh, civic partners, particularly community organizations. So, for example, our approach to Urban Orchard is working with our Canals and Rivers charity because we have technically more canals than Venice by about a metre and a half. Um, and they are planting orchard trees along the canal side and using their volunteers for canal restoration to do that. So I think one of the routes is also using people or engaging with people outside of the food label and mobilizing other routes to enable food work, but without it necessarily having a food stamp on it. Okay. Any other answer? Alguna otra contestación? Uh, uh, yes, so f for Bordeaux, France, um, we had no, um, uh, it was a new delegation, so we had nothing when we arrived a year ago. So we started by creating um, a line, a budget line for uh, food resilience. Um, and um, we have um, two, um, 2.6 million um, euro to create the, uh, the farm uh, and also 100,000 uh, euro to uh, support uh, all the people working uh, in the field of uh, food resilience in the city. Uh, and um, we actually, uh, we are recruiting um, um, a mission uh, project, how do you say that? Uh, someone who's, who's going to be responsible to you know, carry the, uh, the food resilience program. We already uh, have someone um, like, uh, who was already there, but uh, she is a bit over over overwhelmed by, by the project that we have. We have. Uh, and also we have someone who is uh, arriving and who is going to take care about uh, the farm. So uh, um, it's already two, two and a half uh, you know, uh, people working uh, you know, full time on the, the project. And we also created um, a governance system, whereas we, are, we have uh, seven uh, directions working together because since it's very uh, something that's going through all you know uh, different departments so uh, uh, um, and we have um, a kind of a, a cotex so every month they you know work together uh, on, on in their directions so uh, you have uh, the education you have um, uh, you know a team working on the the, the social security um, uh, food uh, so the Alimentary um, solidarity, uh, you know, a project. Uh, we have another team working uh, on the nature part. So we have seven, you know, um, a team, seven direction working together, and uh, that helps uh, us a lot because then we can have more impact. Um, so that's what we uh, did. Okay, merci. 
Tenemos a Tivo. Tivo wants to speak. So, I don't know where is Maria. Okay. Hi. Ah. So, in terms of school canteens, uh, it's important to say that we managed to the switch thanks to a dramatic reduction of food waste, actually. So, we reduced by 80% food waste, which enabled us to, um, to gain, to save around 20 cents per meal, which were then reinvested into uh, organic food. So, basically, we switched at a constant cost. Um, regarding the municipal farm, so it was coming, it, it came actually from the, uh, the municipal budget. Um, it's true that maybe if you do a comparative analysis, the, uh, the vegetables that are produced in the municipal farm are slightly, uh, are slightly more expensive than the one you could buy on the market. But then it raises the question also on how to measure financially uh, positive externalities, such as preservation of biodiversity on your territory, uh, also the positive uh, effects of bringing children directly to the municipal farm in terms of food education, etc. So it's also a commitment from the, from the city to increase uh, the budget uh, towards the municipal farm. And also regarding the rest of our actions, uh, it's true that it comes from external subsidies. So we are very much active and that might be a problem as well because it, uh, it tends to a projectification of our activities. Basically every two years we have to run behind deadlines, to run behind our, our fund, uh, finances so as to call to, to, to get more, more fundings. Uh, yeah, thank you. Merci. Ah, una pregunta. Tenemos diez minutos. So um, in we have ten more minutes. The food systems. Um, so far, it's been also municipal budget, and then uh, this budget is. Um, we don't have a, a concentrated department that is in charge of all food activities, right? So, for example, the canteen uh, food expenses go through the education department. The market management goes through the economic development department. The urban allotments is us who manage them, but building them goes through the urbanism department. So a bit the governance within house is very much fragmented, but most of the activities are covered by municipal budget. Yeah. Uh, Asha, yeah, and later. You, 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 uh, uh, okay. Non, non, non. Donc nous, actuellement à Marseille, nous sommes dans la préservation des terres agricoles et euh, pour l'instant, il euh, n'y a pas d'économie autour de la terre des agricoles. Il y a un vrai combat, c'est celui d'inscrire la modification des terres en zone agricole sur le plan local de l'urbanisme. So the, the main challenge now in Marseille is preserving agricultural lands, actually. So that's the, it's not about money, it's not about funding, it's mainly uh, about preserving agricultural lands in the urban plan. Okay. Ensuite, il y a effectivement un groupe de travail qui uh, œuvre autour de l'économie et de la question de faire venir des fermiers à Marseille. Ça, c'est autre chose. Peut-être j'aurai des choses à vous dire l'année prochaine là-dessus. And then there is a, another, there is a working group actually which is uh, tr striving to uh, bring uh, local farmers to settling, settle down on the territory and she, she's hopeful to have more good news to, uh, to bring next year about that. Thank you very much. We have another question right here. Um, yes, so my name is Anja de Kunto, work for EuroCities on food. Um, I was very inspired by all the presentations. Some of you I know already very well what you're doing, but the others was also very interesting. Many of you touched on challenges coming from national level or European level, procurement, common agricultural policy. Um, I know now the UK has now a national food policy. I would like to know how you're planning to challenge your national government because this incredible high level of ambition is, is going to stay sometimes a bit more restricted if you don't bring it up. And especially I would like to challenge the French cities to go uh, in, in January 2022, we'll start at the French presidency of the European Union. I really would like the French cities to let themselves heard because we are hearing amazing things coming from them, but also the challenges and the necessary, for example, to change common agricultural policy, procurement law, food waste law that is coming up. Thank you for that. Good question. Any answer? How you exchange with your national governments? 
many times they are like blind people. <laughs> Excuse me. So in, in the UK, for our national food strategy, we got very involved with the people writing it. So the start of the national conversation about food was hosted by Birmingham. Uh, and we had the, the lead author came to Birmingham working with the Food Foundation, who are one of our partners who are also supporting the strategy development. So we made an active choice to be active participants in the creation of the strategy. Mm -hmm. And that's allowed us an opportunity to uh, have doors into national government that we wouldn't normally have in conversations about food. So I think it's one of the steps is when a national government is starting its journey okay. to make sure a city has a seat at the table, which is what yeah. we did in the UK. Yes, yes. What about France or Spain? Any word from, from France? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, see, it's the, the really nice and good things about moments like this is that uh, we actually talked uh, the French cities together uh, because of you. So thank you very much for that. And we, yes, I agree. We really need to, you know, um, work together uh, to really make some very, um, some very strong points of, of some, you know, important things. Uh, especially, I was very interested um, with the the point you made about um, the local, um, you know, the regulation about uh, the lo you know the fact the local food and how we need to change that rule. And I think there are many things that we need to work on together. And so, yes, we will do it. Com compartir conocimiento. Sharing knowledge makes um, us strong citizens. Always. Um, so basically, I mean, I agree with what you what you say, and we need to, to share our forces and to to to, uh, to make our messages heard. We we've been actually already active in in terms of advocacy at uh, national and, and uh, European level uh, through diversity of networks. Um, for instance, we've had this uh, European project by Cantines in which we had a public event uh, hosted by uh, a European uh, member of Parliament, Mark Tarabella, so as to bring this message on, on uh, food exception in public procurement. Uh, we're also working with the uh, Franco-Allemand, so the, the French-German um, forum, um, so as to prepare actually the French presidency uh, next year, so as to elaborate. We, we work with a series of, uh, of cities engaged in, in their food transition and transition in general in France and in Germany, so as to see, to capitalize on the learnings what we, of what we have in the ground, on the ground, so as to, uh, to have some, let's say, platform that could replicate those learnings at European level. Uh, so we are trying to, to get involved and also we, I mean, it's an answer, we also rely on you. I mean, as EuroCities to bring those messages, so we would be ha very happy to, to work together with you on, on this. We have two more, two more minutes, so... Una uh, última. I swept from Spanish to English. Sé que os estoy volviendo lo siento. I know I'm driving you crazy. I'm sorry. Well, first of all, thank you for sharing these experiences. I think it's been so beautiful, and thank you for your approach. I am Maria Rivas. I'm a physician specialized in public health. I've been working in Spain for all my life, and now I am working in Birmingham with Justin. and. Uh, I wanted to underline a sociological concept about recovering what he said, how important is health in cities. The concept of empowering public health, we have forgotten this concept and this uh, pandemic has shown us that uh, the um, climate emergency is uh, public health. And I think that dialogues and conversations must be focused on reinforcing these uh, health care systems in the cities. Uh, for example, in Spain, the public health uh, 
is in hospitals and in the small surgeries. I'm talking about the municipalities. They need to empower themselves in public health. And this has happened in the United Kingdom with this transfer and these, uh, um, for example, the public health and the mental health because this shows a lot of inequalities and we need to build healthy communities and we women, the feminine part, and when I talk about women, I talk about a wider concept and uh, it is very important this new way of establishing relationships between all of us. Well, thank you very much. A round of applause, please. So we, this is the end of our session. Thank you to the technicians, especially Anna because uh, she is a great mic uh, microphone runner, one of the best in the event. And uh, uh, the small things are great from Schumacher, a uh, book I truly recommend you. It was written 50 years uh, ago, but it's very modern. And uh, so we don't see it's not a competition between countries, between cities, because countries love to compete because uh, it's a good way to find their identity. But we cities dialogue like, uh, you know, women, friends who share uh, their experiences of the day. So knowledge is uh, sh knowing what you know and what you don't know. So. Eating well is a very wide concept. Not long ago was eating two kilo meat steak uh, because, uh, you know, our grandparents uh, um, couldn't eat as much as they wanted. So this is why diets, rich diets uh, and good diets uh, were considered to be based on meat. We are going to eat a lot of meat. We are to have, going to have a lot of success. Things have changed because eating well makes us better people and better citizens. Uh, thank you very much.